Okay, you see a picture up there that 1,000 of health care workers are, in, are thousands, not 1,000, thousands of health care workers are infected with the virus, and many have died. And there is a typical uh, protection, eyes, mouth, I mean, they're covered from head to toe, and they're still getting the virus, okay? Now, we're going to pray. And we have a right to do this. The Bible says that <clears throat> no plague will come nigh you in the Old Testament. None of these diseases. We have a right to pray for God's protection. Is that an amen? amen. Now, don't get me wrong. We got to do what we know to do. Or else we'll be tempting God. And you don't want to tempt God or test God. You want to be practical, but God's the one's going to save us from these things. So we want to pray that all of God's followers are protected from the virus. Is that an amen? And all diseases, not just the virus. Secondly, we're going to pray for a very serious problem in our nation. <clears throat> the socialists and communists are absolutely trying to take over this nation. And it's a shame that Christian people aren't informed on this, and this is our job as a church who is informed to get the message out. <clears throat> they are trying to destroy our Constitution, get away from it, and a Bible form of government. They are also trying to prohibit the words of Jesus. We're not talking about the freedom of religion here. We're talking about the freedom to speak the words of Jesus. Remember in Washington, D.C., there is no Muslim verses anywhere on, in those buildings. There is no uh, engravings of Muslim or Hindus or so forth in our founding fathers' buildings back there. Isn't that an amen? It is the Bible. And it says, endowed by their creator. The creator is Jesus and God, who is God. And so we want God to protect the message of the words of Christ not the words of religion we don't need any more religions we need the words of Jesus amen so we're going to sing God bless America as a prayer and during this time just pray that God would put his hand of protection on us the church and American people Lifting up our voice in prayer. Father, we come to you in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. We ask your protection hand upon your people, Lord, from this virus and all diseases. Show, Lord Jesus, that your people are separated from all the nations of the earth by your presence and your protection upon the followers of Christ. Lord, we ask you, Jesus, to turn our nation back to what is right. Lord, raise up voices in America. Raise up a unified effort. Lord, to destroy the voices of the socialists and the communists in this nation. To turn from our Constitution and Bible moral values. Father, we just ask you, Lord, for your protection in these things. Come, Lord. Come and put your hand of protection upon us. And let your people have peace. Oh, peace that passes understanding in the midst of turmoil. 
Jesus, 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 Jesus. We pray these things in your name. Amen and amen. their homes, you would protect their land where they came from, God, Lord, when they assembled and put you as a priority in their life, God, you would go and, Lord, be a, a hedge and a protection around all that they possess, God, and, Lord, we pray for the church's gathering this morning, God, Lord, that you protect them, Lord, you protect them from this disease, protect them from, Lord, God, the, the enemy's attacks, Jesus, Lord, please, we call on you, Jesus, protect your church today. Thank you for the rest of our 
Jesus, we thank you, God, for how great you are and how we can come together, Lord, after being gone for so long in one accord, seeking you and praising you and feeling your presence as a body of Christ. And we thank you, God, that you honor your word that says when two or more are gathered together, that you're in the midst of us, touching us, reviving us, giving us counsel, giving us wisdom. Jesus, we praise you and we ask that you would speak to our hearts this morning in Jesus' name and amen. You may find your seats in his presence. Good morning again, everyone. <clears throat> We're going to start off by remembering. Jesus said, remember the word that I said unto you, and that's one of our problems. We forget quickly what we learned uh, just five minutes ago. Or, that's exaggerating, of course, but you know what I mean. So we found in past lessons that God's first plan was to save the nations, not just the Jewish people, to save all people. We found that Israel was chosen to reach the nations, and they failed. They didn't do it. <clears throat> they became segregated. They wouldn't reach out to other people at all, enclosed. So Jesus took the kingdom from the Jews, the Israelites, the Hebrews, and gave it to those bearing its fruit. And the fruit of the kingdom is righteousness, peace, and joy, and power. In the Holy Ghost. Power. The kingdom is in power, not talk. And we got to remember that. We saw that Jesus did three things when he started ministering. He went to the Jewish synagogues, and all the Jews had a different synagogue. There was a synagogue of the Libertines, those who had gotten liberty uh, and gotten citizenship in the Roman Empire. There was the synagogue of the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the Zealots, uh, the Grecians, and so forth. Just like today, we have all these denominations. Jesus taught in the Jewish denominations. But he didn't stop there. The Jews wouldn't even allow unbelievers in most of their synagogue. He preached the kingdom of God to all people we saw. And the third thing is he did signs and wonders, healing all sicknesses. This is totally proof that God is supernatural. When he can do what humans can't do, it proves there is a God. Nothing else. When God comes to you and saves your soul supernaturally by his spirit, 
you know there's a God. From the day I got saved, I knew there was a God. I didn't need anybody convincing me there was a God. I knew there was one. <clears throat> so, we found if we seek the Lord till He comes, and that's one of our problems. We seek Him in a rush. We seek Him to get on to the next thing. But the Bible says, seek Him until He comes and rains righteousness upon you. You seek till the rain falls. Then we also found in the Bible that a fountain shall be opened in the house of David, the house of God, to cleanse from sin and impurity. And folks, being cleansed from sin and impurity is not a human capability. It is a supernatural work that God does. And you have to have the rain to have the fountain. The rain's got to fall from heaven, bring up the water table to the surface before you can have an artesian well, a fountain, a stream, uh, a spring coming out of the ground. Amen? So we need to seek the Lord first until He rains. His presence comes. Not just seek Him to be going through the motions. We also found that the kingdom of God is within us. You are where God rules. We also found, he says, to seek first the kingdom of God and all these other things will be added unto you. If we keep the kingdom of God as priority, these natural things, your house, your food, your clothing, your shelter, everything you're so worried about, he'll open the door for them, for you to possess it. We found that we enter the kingdom by righteousness. Jesus is the gate. He is the door of the kingdom. His death, His blood on the cross makes us righteous. That is our position of righteousness by the blood of Christ. He cleanses us from all past sin. But you've got to go through that door into the kingdom where Jesus, the King of righteousness, sits on the throne. And he has laws and rules to follow. And when you serve the king of righteousness in his kingdom which is within you, your condition of righteousness is going to rise up to your position of righteousness. You're going to become a new creature that all things of sin have passed away. All things have become new things of righteousness. Amen? That's what we found. You also got to be reborn by the Spirit and by the Word to enter the kingdom. This is a supernatural work. It is not a mental thing. It is not something, some ritual you go through. God is involved in your salvation and He's involved in your entry into the kingdom and He's the one involved when you're in the kingdom. Then you got to be converted. You got to change from sin and darkness to right and light. And then you got to become like a child, and a child obeys their parents where they understand why or not. They just obey. You don't have to understand everything. Just do what God said to do. Could that be an amen? Why, Lord? Yeah. Just do it. And then God will open the understanding. So today we're going to go and continue talking about the kingdom of God which is within you. We need to find it within you. And the message of the kingdom is repent. Repent and bring forth the fruit of repentance. Don't just feel sorry for being wrong. Change it. Is that an amen? Yes. yes. So we're going to go to Matthew 5.3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, when you were in school, as I've said before, when you did a story problem, <clears throat> the word is means equal. What's on the left side of that sentence equals what's on the right side of that sentence. For instance, if I said, the water between the shores of North and South America and Europe and Africa is the, the Atlantic Ocean. See, so what is the Atlantic Ocean? The water between 
the shores of the Americas, Europe and Africa and so forth. See, it's the same terminology. It's the same synonym. So God is saying here, the kingdom of heaven is, is equal to those that are poor in spirit. That is the kingdom. That's what the kingdom is equal to. But when we go to Luke chapter 6 verse 20, Luke says, Blessed are you poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. But we got to remember, everything in the Bible is hidden in parables, allegories, metaphors. And it takes the Spirit to open your understanding to these things. That's why the Holy Spirit, God's Spirit, is so important. You can't understand the Bible, folks, with an intellectual approach. So, is Luke right or is Matthew right? Well, let's just look at it logically. When Jesus chose his apostles, they all had jobs. <clears throat> None of them were poor. Some of them most of them owned houses. Some of them had ships to fish with. That takes money. Okay, they had possessions. He never went and called any beggars. He didn't go to the beggars in the streets to make them apostles. And he did not go to the indebted servants, which Obama and uh, President Bush and... Uh, Oprah Winfrey and all of them say uh, the Bible approves of slavery. It doesn't approve of slavery. Nowhere in the Bible does it approve of slavery. But if you got in debt or you were poor, you could hire yourself to someone to pay your bills. And seven years, you could work it off and be free again. He didn't go to these kind of people. He went to those people who had their act together in the natural. How many know the Bible says first the natural, then the spiritual? Are you out there? First the natural. You've got to get your natural act together before God is going to give you spiritual revelations. Okay? Spiritual power especially. So... We know that impartial Jesus invited all nationalities. We studied that. He invited the rich as well as the poor into his kingdom, the sick as well as the healthy. He invited the widows and the orphans to political or religious affiliations. He didn't care about them. He invited them all into his kingdom. <clears throat> Soldiers, slave owners, slaves, harlots, male, female. He had no impartiality, whether you're single, whether you're a heathen, or you had a special doctrine like you can only walk so far on the Sabbath day. Didn't bother Jesus at all. You see, Jesus can come any minute today. Didn't bother Jesus at all. Tongues is the only sign of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Didn't bother Jesus at all. Once saved, always saved. Didn't bother Jesus at all. He just went and preached the kingdom of God to them. Amen? Now, if you experience that kingdom, it's going to affect your special doctrines. It's going to affect your political and religious affiliations. It's going to change the way you see things. But until you change and get by coming into the kingdom, he's inviting everyone into his kingdom. So the poor or the rich... Or anyone has no special privilege to the kingdom except the poor in spirit. Wow. Now, let's go to Isaiah to prove this. All right, Isaiah 57, verse 15. <clears throat> thus saith the Lord, or thus saith the high and lofty one, who inhabits eternity, woo, whose name is holy. Why would he open up a topic like that? Why would he say that? I dwell in the high and holy place. He replaces lofty with holy. This is where I live. I live in a high and holy place. I live in eternity. 
with the inhabitants of eternity. Wow. Are you following that? See, he's, he's telling us how to understand what's coming. Do you ever ask God why? You ought to start trying it. Why, when, where, how, and why? Uh, and what? All right. I dwell in a high and holy place with Him. Now, all throughout the Bible, the translators have really <coughs> used pronouns uh, incorrectly. God is not interested in just a male. He's interested in mankind. All right. Many places where God uses him, it is mankind. All right. Everybody. He's interested in everybody. He dwells with those who have a contrite and humble spirit. Contrite means smitten, shattered. But it's not a physical thing. It's not a natural thing. It's what? spiritual thing he dwells with those in eternity in the holy place with those who have a smitten and humble spirit humble means low you don't think yourself any better than anyone else and when you're mistreated you don't fight back because of their ignorance and mistreating you and talking to you about you all right that's humble <clears throat> why did he do all this to revive to make alive the spirit of the humble the lowly the meek to revive the heart the mind the inner man you have a spirit within you that has a mind it has a will and it has feelings and so he comes when the, <clears throat> you are smitten and you're broken into pieces by life. He wants to revive the contrite ones and get them living in eternity in his high and holy place. Amen? Do you see that? See, it has nothing to do with being poor spiritually or or physically or anything it's got to do with the spirit so let's go to another verse Isaiah 66 1 Isaiah here says heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool where's the house you're going to build me what natural house am I going to be contained in can't build a house that big and the Bible says he does not dwell in buildings made with hands why we are the kingdom he lives in us so he asked this question, <clears throat> where is the place of my rest? Where do I abide? Now, up here we know his presence is in eternity. He is holy with people of a broken and humble spirit. Amen? Now, he's going to answer, all these things was made by my hand. I made the heavens. I made the earth. I made everything that you see for human beings to inhabit, my footstool is the earth where human beings are. See, the sun may be the center of our universe, but the earth is the center of God's. <laughs> and it's not that globe. It's human beings. Amen? So, all these things exist. I made these things. Everything you see in the heavens and the earth, I made them. They exist. So where do I dwell? On this. And when you see it italicized, it's not in the scriptures. And so they put in the word that they think will fit. And this is where you need a lexicon if you're going to study the Bible for real. You've got to be able to dissect these verses and know what he's actually talking about. On this will I look, okay, on poor and of a contrite spirit who trembles at my word. 
So people who are poor of spirit. Got it? See, he's talking about the spiritual world, not the natural world. And crushed in spirit. You can be crushed in your daily life by your bad choices. You can be really hurt. But God is talking about the spirit. Hallelujah. He can change you from the inside out. Now, we know, first comes the natural, then the spiritual. We know that people that are poor have need of food, clothing, shelter, drink, uh, medical attention, and so forth, don't we? They can't provide it for themselves, so they need help. That's what poor in the natural world means. We agree on that? See, first the natural, then the spiritual. So if I'm poor in spirit, then what are my needs? I need spiritual food, the word. I need spiritual drink, the spirit of God, the presence of God. I need spiritual medicine to heal my spirit, you see. I need spiritual shelter, the body of Christ, to assemble together and united. See, I need those things. Hallelujah. Now, the question is, do you have to be impoverished to be poor? No. I ate a meal yesterday. I still need what? A meal today. I drank yesterday, but I still need to what? Drink from my physical body today. Amen? And so when you recognize you have a need for spiritual things, you don't have to be lean in your soul. You don't have to be impoverished and bankrupt in the spiritual world. You just know, I need to eat of the Word today. I need to eat of the Word this week. It's not yesterday that's going to keep me going. It's today. Poor in spirit, needy in spirit. And this is the problem. Most Christians do not read their Bible or study the Bible. They don't get the lexicon out. Most Christians, they get to the Christian bookstore and just teach what the Christian books say. Am I right? I am right. You know it. Most Christians don't even go to the Christian bookstore. They just believe what they hear on the radio and Internet especially. The Internet is so full of junk, but if it's on the Internet, they believe it. So, poor in spirit is needing spiritual things. Can I hear an amen? Can I hear a big amen so out there they can hear it? Amen. Yes. I am shocked at how people don't pray until a crisis comes. See, we need prayer. We need worship. We need these things in our life. It, it amazes me how we won't pray and seek God to prevent catastrophes, but when one happens, man, we get serious about prayer. Are you there? And then we take credit for praying. If God gets us through it, ah, we pr I prayed, or so-and-so prayed. Folks, it isn't your prayer. You are just doing what God asked you to do. He is the provider of everything. Isn't that right? Okay. There's no magic in your prayer. The magic is in God listening to us. All right? So, they tremble at my word. What word? The gospel of the kingdom of God. This is what God is trying to get through to us. Miracles, signs, and wonders happened because Jesus taught the kingdom of God, not finances, not positive thinking, not faith thinking. He taught the kingdom of God, repent and bring forth the fruits of repentance, and God the Father backed him up with signs followed. And if we want signs following today, we got to preach the gospel of the kingdom. Is that an amen? Now, 
I'm going to try and show you how this works. You can be contrite, broken, and natural life. You choose drugs, you choose prostitution with its venereal diseases and everything, drugs with its uh, physical problems and, and uh, 80,000 die a year from it in America. <clears throat> you know, you're going to be smitten. You're, you're making choices that's going to just destroy and ruin your life, okay? You want to get greedy and, you know, you want to be violent and solve everything by violence and all that. You're going to wind up being shattered in life. Somebody more violent than you is going to come along and put you down on the ground. Amen? You want to get into witchcraft? You're going to pay a price for it. It's going to shatter your life. And you're going to be smitten. And this... It's what the Bible says. See, people say, God did this to me. God cannot do evil. Let's get away from that mentality. But he invented Satan. He created Satan to do the bad stuff. Are you there? And he does it well. But here in uh, Jeremiah 2.19, your own wickedness will correct you. It's not even Satan. It's your choices. It's your choices. When you choose not to read the Bible, when you choose not to worship and praise, when you choose to take the secular music over God's music, take secular stories over God's stories, uh, uh, moral things, you're going to get lean, the Bible says. God will let you go your own way, but you're going to have leanness in your soul, in your spirit. So he says there's a place where your own wickedness will correct you. Your backslidings will rebuke you. This is for the contrite ones. But down here we have contrite of spirit. God can come along and take that ruined life and put it back together again. He can take that shattered spirit of a person and put it back together again, and the outside results will show what happened on the inside. Powerful. See, that's why Paul wrote, the kingdom of God is not in talk. It's in power. So, we have the other side of poverty here. My soul thirsts for God, the living God. When, I can, when can I go and meet with God? I met with him yesterday. I met with him last week. But I need to meet with my God. See, spiritual poverty, because you have need of spiritual things, is a big difference. Are you with me? I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Job put God's word above his eating habits. Do we? Hallelujah. So, let's go to Luke 4, 8 in closing this message. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Why? Why does God put his Spirit upon us? Because he's anointed me. Anointed. Oh, hallelujah. No, it isn't. Anointed means set apart. That's it. Set apart. The Spirit of the Lord set you apart for a purpose. And what's that purpose? To preach the gospel to the poor. What poor? The physical poor? No. The spiritual poor. They that are looking for spiritual answers. Amen. <clears throat> the preaching of the gospel to will heal the brokenhearted. The preaching of the gospel will, will liberate the captives. The Bible says if you, <clears throat> uh, if you uh, commit sin, you're a slave of sin. God can come along and deliver the addicts, the prostitutes, the greedy people, there is no sin he can't liberate you from. And that includes the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost. Recovery of sight to the blind. You read the Bible and you just don't get anything? God's preaching of the Word. As you keep reading and hearing it, he's going to open your eyes to the truth of God's Word. 
It's going to set at liberty those oppressed. Jesus went about doing good, the Bible says, and delivering those oppressed of the devil. You don't have to be possessed by the devil to have problems. He troubles you. He comes to tempt you. He comes to get you to, to stray away from the road of righteousness. He's also an accuser. You do any little thing wrong, he's going to be there saying, You're no good. You're no good now. There's no hope for you. You're just a phony Christian. No, I can repent. I can get up and I can walk. Amen? That's why repentance and the fruit of repentance is so important in the plan of salvation. Not faith and grace. Now, here is a contriting machine. All right? Here is a glass that didn't make it through the process correctly. It's kind of sagging. It's worthless. All right? Here's the right glass. Here's a deformed glass. You probably can't see it, but it dips here. It, it, the lip just sagged. Okay? Now, what does the glass people do? They don't throw out that glass. They put that glass in the contriting machine, which pulverizes it, smites it into tiny pieces. Then it goes to the master craftsman who puts it under the fire and makes another vessel out of it. You out there on the internet, if your life is shattered, if you've done things that you're just really broken, your life is shattered, God is not willing that you stay that way. He, if you will reach out to him and admit your choices have been bad, he will shape you back into a worthy vessel. As though this never happened, the new glass will come out perfect. And you may have to go through his contriting machine many times. You understand? But if you will let God come and shatter you. He will put you back through his process and make you a worthy vessel unto the Lord. Old things passed away. This is God's promise. <clears throat> the old life passed away. That old stuff passed away. A new way of living. Hallelujah. And for those of you Christians who don't read your Bible and worship and pray consistently, you need to understand that that hunger for God's word, that need for prayer, for his presence, for tithing, for fellowshipping, for healing of your spiritual man, <clears throat> comes by you realizing you have a spiritual need. Amen? See, we know in the natural world, if I do not eat certain vitamins, certain diseases is going to come. So in the spiritual world, if I don't eat and drink properly and follow God's rules properly, even though I'm a believer, bad things are going to happen in my spiritual life. Now, so we cross over God's mercy line. You see, when we cross over God's mercy line, He isn't wanting to throw us in the pit. It's just He's going to let our sins correct us. <clears throat> see, nothing happens without God's approval. He just doesn't do anything bad, but He allows bad, what? To correct you. To turn you. And the thing you don't want to do is cross over God's mercy line. And we're going to pray this morning a song that says this. Don't let me cross over God's mercy line. Will you bow your heads with me and pray with this prayer?
Lord, I can't seem to change. Oh, Satan is using my body and my mind. Don't let me cross over, over God's mercy. Well, I know there's a deadline that I'll have to face. I know. Shackles of sin. I promise to never serve Satan again. I know that. Of death seizing power, I've tried and I pleaded, but no peace can I find. So don't let Don't let me cross over, over God's mercy. Whether you're here or whether you're out there on the internet, if God is speaking to you today, whether your life is just pulverized and crushed, or whether you've just neglected the spiritual needs by not reading your Bible, by not praying, by not having a daily life to feed your spiritual man. And you want Jesus to come. The song said, I promise to never serve Satan again. Satan's the one that tries to distract us, troubles us, accuses us. If you'll respond to God's word today and admit that you need spiritual food, spiritual drink, spiritual things, 
And if you have been serving the kingdom of darkness and your life is just pulverized and smitten and shattered and you want Jesus to put you back together and make you a worthy vessel of him, will you just stand, whether you're on the internet looking or here in the congregation, will you just stand? And if you're one that has a daily life, will you just stand saying, I'm going to keep it up. I need spiritual food. I need spiritual things. I don't want to wait for a catastrophe to come along. I want to prevent it. And let's lift up our voice and let's pray for ourselves and then let's pray for others. Father, we come to you again by the authority that you have given us in Jesus Christ. And Lord, we just ask you to forgive us for our neglect of your word, neglect of your presence, neglect of your house, neglect, Lord, of spiritual healing in our life. Lord, we ask you to come to our lives that are smitten, to these people's lives that are smitten, Lord, and put them in your contracting machine, your spiritual contracting machine, and make them a new vessel. The old thing passed away, the new life made new. For those of us, Lord, have been neglecting your word and <clears throat> haven't been eating your word like we should, Lord, we ask you to come and give them, Lord Jesus, the power to seek you, knowing that they have need of spiritual food, spiritual drink, spiritual healing, spiritual things. And Lord, if they, we acknowledge that, that's what the kingdom of heaven is all about. God dwells with people who will recognize they need Jesus, the living God. That they need his word, that they need his presence, they need his medicine. They need him. Lord, the kingdom of heaven is made of those people and you inhabit those people and they inhabit eternity with you. Lord, we just Pray your blessing upon everyone that's heard this message today that they respond to your spirit, knowing, Lord, that you will finish the good work you've begun in their life. And not only that, Father, but we, as people of God, can share your word of the kingdom, and you will use that word to bring many back into you, restore many back into you, to revive. Lord, you come to revive. You didn't come to reject. You come to revive the heart, the mind, the will, the feelings of the contrite ones. You come to revive, Lord, the, the humble people's spirit. You come, Lord, not to destroy us, but to restore us. And as a church, Lord, we proclaim your gospel and the power of Jesus' name and the power that he has to heal and restore over everyone that's listened to this message today. Thank you, Lord, that it's so simple and we can possess it. We ask you to open that fountain of cleansing inside of everyone today. We ask you, Lord Jesus, to give us that desire and that commitment to seek you until you rain down upon us and pour out of our innermost being those waters of life. Lord, we're asking for a big revival. There are so many out there that don't know the right hand from the left. And your church has the words of life that Jesus gave them. Lord, give us the fortitude to speak it, for it's in the speaking of the word that you will do great things. Thank you, Lord, for your healing today. Thank you for the restoration power that you're doing right now in people's lives. And don't ever let us cross over God's mercy line where we have to be corrected by sin, corrected by Satan, using us to where we finally come to our wits end and then cry out to God. Lord, let us stay on the other side of your mercy line and just keep drinking and eating and participating of spiritual things. 
In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Hallelujah. We're going to close our service right now online. And we thank you for joining us. But for those that are here, I'm going to open it up to questions and answers. All right, you can find your seat.